Can you hear me? Kind of. <clears throat> okay, there are there are two there are two handouts. There are two handouts for today. One is the syllabus and the other is the project. So if you get them now, fine. If you don't get them now, you can get them after class. You really don't need them during the class so and actually you can download the PDF too if you want so let's make sure you're in the right room this is corporate finance uh, in case you wanted to be in strategy this ain't it right so time for you to abandon course and leave if you if you're in the wrong class and the first thing I want you to do is look around the room right it's a big class you know why I say that every year I get at least two evaluations that complain that it was a big class. When did you miss the clue? Right? So this is a big class, but you're not going to be able to hide. So I'm going to, no, I, I'm going to seek you out and find you if you try to hide somewhere, saying it's a big class, I can kind of fade into the background. So it is a big class, but 
I'm going to be there every moment for the next 15 weeks. I'm going to haunt you. I'm going to harass you. I'm going to nag you. I'm not going to leave you alone until May 12th. May 8th is the last class. May 12th is the final. Then I'm going to let you go for a while. Right? So let's set the table first. Let's kind of get a sense of who's in this class. How many MBA 2s are there in this class? OK. So this is a good group, right? So kind of form a group already. You're all MBA 2s. You're the, the few and the brave, I guess. How many uh, Langone students are there? Okay. The rest are MBA 1. Are there any non-Stern students here? Okay. Oh, it's a fair number. So the class itself is about 320 as of this morning. So basically, it's a pretty big class. And most of you are MBA 1. So if you're part of the first year, the, the full-time full MBA class, pretty much everybody in the class is here. Every block is here which means I can wreak havoc on every other core class that you guys have, and I will. I have no qualms about doing it. So, uh, no, actually, I will try to let people know when I'm giving quizzes and stuff so that I don't empty our classrooms and I don't get blamed for whatever happens. So let me ask you a second question. How many of you have never taken a, how many of you have taken foundation simultaneously with this class? OK. So you have some company. Don't freak out. It's OK. There's nothing you learned in foundations that was so profound that if you don't have it, you're not going to be able to get this class. So it's OK. How many of you have never, never taken a finance class till last semester? OK. I just want you to see that you'll have lots of company no matter how desolate you think you are, right? This is a class which is a diverse class. A lot of people here have never taken finance, and my job is to make sure that you're all along for the ride. So I'm going to start with a very few logistical details before we dive into what this class is going to be about. Now, I, my office is in K, I should be specific, KMEC 969, so it's in the finance department. It'll be pretty easy to find. I have a phone number. I never answer my phone. I never check my voicemail. So it's there just for sure. I'm supposed to have the number there. So don't call me. Don't leave messages. I won't get them, right? <laughs> if you're going to get me, it's usually by email. So usually I'm pretty good about answering my email. So wherever I am in the world over the next four months, if you have an email question, it should come back with an answer. I have office hours, but I'm going to say something very strange. If you want to really ask me some questions, the best time to do it is not during office hours. It's a very strange way to describe this. So you look at the office hours, they're paltry. They're built around the two classes I teach Monday, Wednesday. I teach this class from 10.30 to 11.50, and I teach a valuation class to the undergraduates at 2 o'clock, which is another 300-person class. So today I'm here anyway, so I put the office hours there because I'm there. But if you really want to ask me a question, maybe a question that requires follow-up, I what is called the fair game principle. So here's how it works. If you find me, I'm fair game. <laughs> so for the next 15 weeks, we're going to play this little game of my trying to make it as difficult. Actually, not. not. So if you find me, no matter where. But I have my own strategic ways of kind of reducing this contact, like taking the stairs, because I know most of you are too lazy to take the stairs. While you wait for the elevators, I'll take the stairs. So if you really want to catch me with questions, hang out around 9 o'clock on the stairways. <laughs> and as I walk by, you can start asking me questions. So basically, wherever you catch me, ex I'll have two exceptions. One is restrooms. <laughs> and the reason is because it'll be discriminatory, obviously, right? No. Only, only the one poor, I, I hope it's discriminatory in that you don't overwhelm whatever rules are there are just to come into a restroom to ask questions. So no restroom questions. And this doesn't apply anymore, but when Coles was open, it was one semester where every time I got on a treadmill, somebody from this class, the same person, got on the treadmill next to me and would ask me questions through my running. So the second rule is if my pulse rate exceeds 100, I'm not responsible for any answer I might give you. Right? So on that stairwell, by the time I get to the seventh floor, I'm out of breath. You ask me a question, I'll give you an answer. I have no idea what I'm even saying. Right? But 
seriously, for the next 15 weeks, if you catch me on the street, on the stairwells, wherever, and you have a question, go ahead. There are three TAs for the class. Sanam, Hussein, and Jorge have all taken this class. They know this class. They know what I put people through. They know the questions you're going to face. They will have, I'll, I'll send out the office hours you know, sometime after class today. But they will have one TA review session each week starting next week. There's nothing really they can do this week because we won't cover enough. But there will be one. It's, um, it's, it's in a classroom that fits 60. Basically, what they will do, actually, is take problems I've given from past quizzes that relate to the material from that week. So if you're really having trouble with the mechanics of the class, with the number crunching part, a you know, good thing to do might be to check out those TA office hours. Okay. So that's the structure of the class. Let me lay out how I plan to torture you for the next 15 weeks. You're pretty much going to get an email every day until May 8th. Let me take that back. I will let you be from May 12th, March 12th to see your spring break. You might as well get you know, some, rel you know, some relief, relief from the questions. But every day you're going to get an email. And here's how it's going to work. Monday we'll have class. And after class today, I'll send you an email, basically reminding you that there was class. And even if you are mentally absent, that this is what we did today in class. And maybe give you a few links on stuff building off the class. So that's today. Tomorrow, I'll put up what's called, I'll call it corporate finance news story slash puzzle. What I will try to do is pick a news story that's live, that relates to something we did in class that week. So this week, we're going to talk about corporate governance. So I'll give you a preview of what the first puzzle is going to be. It's going to be about the Tata Group and the corporate governance struggles that are going out there. I have a blog post on it that I wrote a few months ago. I'll put that up, and I'll also put the news stories. And here's what I'd like you to do. I'd like you to think about, and I'll, I'll list out three or four questions that come out of the news and say, what do you think about these questions? And I'd like you to think about answers to those questions. Let me be clear. This is not graded. You don't have to turn it back to me. You don't even have to do it. But I'll put it out there. That's the other thing about this class is I will dump stuff on you that you, know, you might decide to do 50% of it, 70% of it, 90% of it, or all of it. And I will let and some of the stuff you don't need for this class, per se. But you might find helps you master corporate finance as a discipline. So every Tuesday, I'll put up a weekly puzzle of the week. And that puzzle will shift as the topic shift. On Wednesday, of course, we have class again, a follow-up to that class. On Thursday, I will send you an email about the project. You're saying what project you're going to find out soon enough, that there is a project that's already started. You didn't know it yet. And I'm going to kind of push you as we go through. Think of this essentially as my guilt mechanism, basically, because here's what I know will happen. It's a 15-week project. It's due on May 8th. I would like you to do it as we go through the class. But I'm a realist. I know you'll start with the best of intentions, and you're going to fall behind. So each week, I'm going to send you a picture of where you're supposed to be in the project, hoping that when you see where you actually are, enough guilt or fear is evoked that you start to do something about it. And I'll also tell you, based on the 30 years that I've taught this class, that it doesn't work <laughs> until about the 14th week. You say, oh my god, I haven't even picked a company yet. Right? I've been asked why I don't ask people to turn in stuff every week to keep, because you're grown ups. I, 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 and nobody's ever not finished this project. It just means that last week you have no sleep at all because you're catching up with stuff. But all I will do in that, in that email weekly is if you want to keep up with the project, here's what I'd like you to do this week. On Friday, I'll put up, uh, I'm very fond of talking to my computer while recording myself. I'm like the Kim Kardashian of, of, uh, of uh, yeah. <laughs> So basically, this is without all the, 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 the rest of the stuff, no jewelry being stolen. No, no. Basically, this is an in-practice webcast. You say, what the hell is that? It's about a 12 to 15 minute webcast where I will take what we talked about that week and say, if you were doing this in a real company, where would you find the information? How would you work with the information? This is about getting your hands dirty. So when we talk about corporate governance, we're going to talk about boards of directors, right? So in the first webcast, I'll take you through how you find the boards of directors for your company and what you do as a follow-up, what kinds of questions you might want to ask. And I will pick a company that I will use as my lab experiment. So each week, 
for that something we did that week that's practical, I will look at, you know, so I'll put up a YouTube video on doing it so that when you do your project, you know where to look. On Saturday, there'll be a newsletter. Not much news, but this is like a GPS. Here's where we were last week. Here's where we plan to be next week. Because let's face it, I've been in large classes, and I know how easy it is, especially as you go through the semester and stuff starts to pile up. You've lost all sense of where you are in the class or where you're going. So this is just, so there's not much news. It's just so that you have a sense of where you are in the class. On Sunday, I'll send an email saying, this is what we're going to do in the week ahead. So that kind of takes care of the whole week. So if you want to block my emails, do it early because they start piling up. But here's what I will do. Every email I send you, I will put into what I call an email chronicle. Basically, I'll just put it so that, you know why I do this for self-protection? Because there will be a point in the class where I say, remember that email I sent to you about the project being due? And you know what you're going to say? I never got that email. <laughs> Very convenient. So this is my device for saying, I don't care whether you ever get my emails. Maybe your email account has been locked and blocked. But you can still check out every email that goes with this class by going to the email chronicles, where I'll keep track of everything. And by the time we get to the 15th week, that's going to be dozens and dozens and dozens of pages, because I have a lot to harass you with. So that's pretty much the structure of the class, very few rules. You know, one of the things I, I do this session on teaching, and one of the things I tell people is, you got to be who you are. I am not the most intimidating force in the world. I can't be Bill Silber. Bill Silber looks at you, you freak out, right? I look at you, what the hell? No, he's not going to do anything to me. So I'm going to have very few rules because I'm very bad at enforcing these rules. So please be here in class and please be on time. But if you can't make it on time, just be here anyway. I'm not going to lock the doors and shut you out. So basically, if you want to, I'd rather have you here 15 minutes late than not at all. So, but I'd like to see you in class. The reason I say that is I'll also, and this is a strange thing, I'll also try to make myself as obsolete as possible over the course of the class, where you say, I don't have to go to class. I'm going to make it very easy for you not to be in class. And some of you will take advantage of it. But I'd really like to see you in class. I won't take attendance. I'm not you know, looking for faces, attaching them names. I'm going to give you a higher grade. There's no participation grade in the class. But I'd still like you to be here. Second, as you can see, if you want to make an announcement to the entire MBA 1 class, this is the place to do it. I know it. So here's what I have to do to make that process formal, because I can't have 15 people lined up at the start of every class saying, I have an announcement, I have an announcement. So if you go to the web page for this class, which, uh, you know, in fact, let me open it up very quickly. I've sent the link out a couple of times. If you look at the bottom, it says class announcement sign up. If you click on that, oh, never mind, I want to, this is very, very stern that they shut me from my own stuff. But, you know. but if, you, if you do it on your computer, get through, the, get through the security stuff they make you get through, which is sometimes so daunting I can't even get into my own pages. No. What you will find actually for each class is a sign up sheet. So basically, what. So all I'm saying is at the start of every class, I will allow one announcement. So go in and put your name in. So if you, I know somewhere along the way, the Latin American students will have the pa a party. That's a big thing about the, uh, so you will want to announce a party. I know it's coming because you always have a great party. So put your name down. No, you know. So whatever your announcement is, just list out your email address, list out the announcement, and I will open up the first minute to two of every class with an announcement. The only thing you need to bring to class with you are the lecture note packets. It look very much the like the slides that you said. And the first packet, is it available at the bookstore yet? Has anybody checked it? Not, not, not. Then I would take my revenge on the bookstore by not giving them the $25 they would charge you for it. The PDF version of the file is online, downloaded, printed off. But please don't use the printers in these two buildings, because you know what's going to happen, right? The lecture note packet, I think, is 320 pages, the first packet. The second is another 200 and something. It's about 600 pages, 600 times 320 years. And you can work out the numbers. And you know what's going to happen to every printer in the two buildings is going to break down. And I'm going to hear about it. So print it off somewhere else. Like if you have a part-time job, 
this is a great way to use it, right? Just use their printers. They have these hefty printers. They have no idea what's being printed. And it's not as if you're printing off a novel or something. It's, it's something to do with you know, your basic job. But bring your lecture note packet with you. That's all you need. So you don't need to bring your books. You don't need to just show up with your lecture notes. In fact, you can just print off the slides for that particular session if you want. If you do miss a class, I told you I'm going to make it really easy for you to make up for missing a class. You can watch the lectures either as a stream, so I'll send the link to it, and or you can I'll put it on YouTube as a, as a as a video. There's a playlist for the class that I've started, so every class will go in there. You can download the file just in case you have that eight-hour flight and you don't want to watch any of the movies. You'd rather watch corporate finance lectures instead. Or if you don't want to see me or the slides, you just want to listen. Maybe this is a long drive. I know none of this will happen because there's so many things which are more fun to do than doing this. So there'll be a downloadable audio file, a downloadable video file. So essentially, if you miss a class, there is no excuse for not catching up. So you, I'm, I'm a realist. I mean, let's face it. You're getting an MBA because you want a job, a better job, a higher paying job. That is, that is mission one, right? Everything else is... So if you get a great interview that you have to fly to in week five, I understand you'll have to leave. Okay? So, but I'll make sure that if you do have to leave for a week or two, that the sessions are there. You can keep up with the sessions. So you're not falling behind in the class. Okay? Now, in terms of where to get the stuff that I will you know, another way this class is described is it's like drinking out of a hose, which is a lot of stuff comes at you. So here are the places you will find all the stuff that goes with this class. The first is the web page for this class that I just showed you. Okay? On that, you will find the, le the links to the lecture notes. You'll find links to a practice prompts. You'll also find the link to every past exam I have given in this class, every past quiz, every past exam. So that's 30 years of exams, which means that when you sit down to prepare for your quiz, your question is, what will the quiz look like? It's no mystery. You know exactly what the quiz will look like. And if you say, how do I prepare for the quiz? The answer is easy. Work through as many practice quizzes as you can, which means with 30 years of quizzes, you can't start 12 hours before the quiz. You might have to start a week before the quiz to get ready. This does up the ante for me, because my quizzes are all open book, open notes. And since you have access to every past quiz I've ever given, you know what my job is for the next semester, right? Is to try to figure out a way to write a quiz that really is past quizzes rehashed, but doesn't look like the past quizzes. So leave that, that that's my challenge, so and I'll, I'll try to rise to that challenge. But every past exam, every past quiz will be on that website. I've also created an iTunes U for this class. Basically, what you will see is the lectures go on with the slides, and I'll put up you know, everything that goes with the class. If you have an Apple device, all you need to do is download the iTunes U app. It's actually a pretty neat app. It's a, it's a very good platform for delivering a class. So you can actually see this. So if you don't you know, if, if, you, if, you find, if you find that you want a more structured platform, the iTunes U platform will work. If you have an Android, you can still, I think, download iTunes U, but you've got to go through some intermediate step to get there. But you should be able to watch the class even if you don't have an Apple device. As I said, there's a YouTube channel where all the classes will go on. So everything for this class will be in multiple places. Okay? Pick your favorite. So don't do all three because it's going to get overwhelming. Pick whichever place is best for you, whether it's the web page or the iTunes U, to kind of keep track of the class. I've um, listed the Google Calendar. I hope I put the right link up, but it should link up to this semester's class. At the moment, it's pretty empty. All it lists are the sessions with the topics. It also lists the quiz dates and the exams, which takes away that excuse you're going to give me on the date that I announced the quiz, saying I never saw this coming. Yes, you did see it coming. You just didn't look. So the Google Calendar lists every quiz date and, every, and the exam. I think the final exam is scheduled for May 12th. Hey, which is the Friday of that first, so it's actually early in the exams week, which is good news and bad news. It's good news because you're going to be done early. The bad news is you won't, won't have that much time to get ready for it. Yeah. So that's a, I, I, do, I will post on my blog as we go through the semester, and since almost everything I post has something to do with corporate finance evaluation, 
When I do post something relating to this class, I will let you know. And you're welcome to not read it, read it, whatever you want to do. In keeping with the current trends, I'm going to use Twitter to deliver stuff to you, maybe provoke you a little. Hey? No, I'm not a heavy Twitter. I mean, I will send you one tweet a week, two tweets, only if you follow me. But I'm on this quest to add followers. I mean, if Kanye West has 45 million followers, I should get at least to 100,000. I'm at 60,200, so help me out here, right? <laughs> so even if you, don't, if you, if, even if you de never use Twitter, you never read any tweets, just add your name, add your friend's name, add your dog's name. No, basically, just get num the numbers up. Right? Okay. So now let's get started on the class. How many people in this class have taken a corporate finance class somewhere in their past lives? Okay. So I'm going to start with a question, and I don't want you to read my answer to the question. I'm going to go back to the previous slide so you're not tempted to look at my answer. If I asked you to describe what we're going to do in this class, what you think corporate finance, and it doesn't have to be the only the people who took corporate finance. You walked into the class. There's this title for the class, corporate finance. What do you think this class is about? Anybody, you know, I'm open to any any de definitions you want to give me about what you think corporate finance is all about? Anybody? So you're walking into a class, you don't even know what the class is about? I could do whatever I want then. So what is corporate finance? You think? Yes? OK, so it is looking at how to invest your scarce resources as a company across competing uses. Let's face it. No matter how big you are as a company of scarce resources, you have to allocate them across multiple uses. So maybe corporate finance is about deciding where to invest your money. OK, anything else? OK, because if you have investments, you've got to raise money. Maybe corporate finance can give some answers about how to finance these businesses, whether you should use equity, whether you should debt, whether you should stay private, or whether you should go public. Anything else? Well, that's the same thing. But because when I think about how to raise money, basically it's all financial, all decisions about raising money, all decisions about investing money. There's one more piece. So you're a great business. You invest in a great business. Why do you invest in a great business? What do you hope to get out of it? For the same reason that a farmer plants crops, right? It's not the, I mean, you might love the fact that the crops are growing, but you plant crops to harvest them. Ultimately, no matter how great a business is and how many great investments it takes and how it finances them, you have to be able to collect cash out of the business. So corporate finance covers investment decisions, it covers financing decisions, it covers dividend decisions. In fact, if you think about it, almost any decision made by a business that involves the use of money is a corporate finance decision. This is an incredibly self-serving definition of corporate finance because, in my view, corporate finance is everything. Now, you went through that week before your start, you know, this, the first week of class. What do they call it now? Launch, right? And it's really brainwashing week, right? Basically, they say everything you've learned in your life is not that much, but now we're going to teach you how to really think. So about six or seven years ago, they invited me to be part of this week, and they haven't invited me back since. <laughs> <laughs> so they said, why don't you come in and talk about your class? I came in with a picture. I said, here's how I think about my class. That's my class, and everything else you're going to be doing in the program is in service of my class. <laughs> and I truly believe it. Those accounting guys spend a lot of time thinking they're on top of the hill. They're just supplying raw material to you to, so that you can do corporate finance. Those marketing guys talking about price and promotion and all that neat stuff. The only reason it matters is it ultimately shows up as margins and cash flow so I can value your business. The strategy guys spinning bullshit stories. <laughs> My job in valuation is to hold you accountable or corporate finance is to hold you accountable and say, that's a nice story, but where does it show up in the numbers? I truly believe that this is the ultimate big picture class. That if you take this platform into any other class you take in the school, you should be able to find where it fits into the platform. 
There are lots of ways you can teach corporate finance. You can teach it as investment bankers practice it. And what, what, what passes for corporate finance and investment banking is almost entirely around the financing decision, right? Because that's where investment bankers come in, is if I as a company want to go out and raise money, then investment bankers are what I need. Investment banking corporate finance is a very small slice of corporate finance. Even if your plans are going to be to end up in investment banking corporate finance, I'm going to teach this as a big corporate finance class. This is about those first principles in finance you need to draw on to run a business. Because if you get that, you can do any small slice of it. So this is a class that if you ask me to describe it, is a big picture class. I know you're already skeptical because every class you sit in, in they talk about big picture. I'm going to be very specific. You're going to see the big picture for this class in a couple of minutes. And everything we do in this class is going to be on that big picture. So this is a class that's a big picture class. It's an applied class. I'm a very simple rule in what I include in this class. If I cannot apply it, I have no time for it. So I'm not going to talk about elaborate theories and models in finance if I can't find a place to apply them. So everything in this class is going to be applied. So my first objective is to make it applied. The second is to make it big picture. The third objective is a little sick, at least when I describe it. I don't think there's a class that's more fun to teach than corporate finance. I don't think there's a subject that's more fun than corporate finance because it unlocks every puzzle you've ever thought about in business. If you understand corporate finance and you read them, it'll change the way you read the financial news. It'll no longer be a news story. It'll be about why is this happening? Let me untangle it. And sometimes you're going to see that what companies do makes sense. And sometimes you're going to see that what companies do doesn't make sense. So at the end of the class in the 15th week, I'm going to put myself to the test. I'm going to ask you, have you been able to apply this class? Do you get the big picture? And then I'm going to ask the question, at a very bad time, right after you've finished your project, you haven't had sleep for four nights, and a final exam is coming up, I'm going to say, was that fun? Not a good time to be asking the question. And I don't expect you to say, oh, that was so much fun. But maybe as you let the material percolate, you're going to see how much fun it is to actually make those pieces come together. So let's start with some very basic stuff. You finished accounting already, right? Was that in the first semester for most of you? Okay. Or you waved out of accounting. Now, if that was your first experience with financial stuff, I'd like you to let it go. I want you to stop thinking like accountants. If you're already an accountant, this is going to be really tough. But I want you to stop thinking like accountants. And here's what I mean by this. Accountants have a mindset that governs how they think about the world. And it's captured when you look at an accounting balance sheet. So somebody help me out here as I go through an accounting balance sheet. And you tell me how accountants measure items on a balance sheet. And you're going to get some perspective on how, how accountants think about the world. So first, accountants break down assets into assets that live for a long time, fixed assets, land, building, equipment, machinery. Current assets, inventory, accounts receivable into financial investments if you have investments in other companies and intangible assets. Let's take each item. When you invest in land and building and equipment, how does accounting work? How do, when you see a number in a balance sheet that says fixed assets, what does that number capture? In an accounting statement. So I could show you Coca-Cola's balance sheet. Look at the fixed assets. Where does that number come from? It comes from what was originally invested in that fixed asset 20, 25, 30, 50 years ago. Net of whatever the accountant thought was the loss in value of that asset, which they captured with that magical depreciation number, it is a historical cost. Right? Current assets are closer to current value, partly because your inventory doesn't sit around 15 years. So inventory accounts receivable are closer to what the current cost is. What happens if I make an investment in another company? How do accountants record that? Let's take Yahoo. Yahoo is a dead man walking right now, right? They're basically, the entire value of Yahoo comes from two holdings, one in Alibaba and one in Yahoo Japan. If I look at Yahoo's balance sheet, they own 14% of Alibaba. Right now, the market cap for Alibaba is 200 billion plus. 14% of 200 billion plus should be about 
28 billion, right? So if I look at Yahoo's balance sheet, will I see 28 billion? You should, right? Common sense, but that's not the way accounting works. Because it's not classified as an investment held for trading, it's recorded at what Yahoo, um, Yahoo originally paid for their Alibaba investment. And that number might be 2 billion or 3 billion, not 28 billion. You see where I'm going? Even within accounting statements, you can see the inconsistency. Some numbers are marked to market, some are not, some are historical costs, some are current costs. And then you get intangible assets. Let's pause. Let's not think like accountants. Let's think of intangible assets at companies. And let's think about whether they could have value. What's Coca-Cola's biggest intangible asset? Brand name, right? Not the syrup. Let's not throw that in there, because nobody cares about the syrup, to be quite honest, because Coca-Cola doesn't even taste the same in different countries. We know the syrup varies across countries. It's a brand name. If you ask me what Apple's biggest intangible asset is, you can talk about styling and technology. Basically, you can think about intangible assets that are worth tens of billions of dollars. But if you look at accounting balance sheets, 85% of intangible assets and accounting balance sheets come from one item. What's that item? Goodwill. The most useless and destructive item ever created. And here's what. To show you how meaningless goodwill is, let's see how it shows up on a balance sheet. What does a company have to do for goodwill to manifest itself on its balance sheet? Yeah. It has to buy somebody else, right? Because if it's bought, it goes into some. It has to buy somebody else. So already we can see the problem with goodwill. If I'm the greatest company in the face of the earth, and I've built myself up entirely with internal investments, there will be no goodwill on the balance sheet. Take a look at Apple, the most valuable company in the world, according to market cap, or at least the most valuable equity in the world, based on market cap, 600 billion plus. Take a look at their balance sheet. There's almost no goodwill. Why? Because Apple has never done a big, uh, the biggest acquisition might be that Beats acquisition, which is what, 3 billion? That's like penny chain. They probably didn't even notice the money was spent. We have 250 billion cash. Oh, 3 billion, oh my God, dropped out, out of my pocket. Because they haven't done a big acquisition, there is no goodwill. But you look at companies like HP or Cisco, you see huge goodwill items. Why? Because they've grown through acquisitions. Now let's take the next step. You do an acquisition. How does the accountant come up with this goodwill number? What is it the difference between? Let's see how much brainwashing accounting has already done on you. It's a difference between what you paid, obviously, and... So what did you say? Uh, the real value of your net assets. Brainwashing. <laughs> I don't want to hear words like what it's worth, fair value, real value. It's really accounting book value dressed up. Dressed up by whom? By other accountants. There's this dance called purchase price allocation that you do right after an acquisition. Here's what happens. A tandem of accountants show up. They do a dance around. They move things around. After six weeks and tens of millions of dollars, they move the decimal point over once, I've revalued your assets. It's really book value dressed up, and dressing up book value is like dressing up a turkey. No matter what kind of outfit you put on a turkey, it's going to look like a turkey, right? That's crony neck, tough to... So let's say you have a company with a book value of four billion, or a dressed up book value of four billion, and I pay 10 billion. You got a six billion dollar problem to explain away as an accountant, right? So what do you do? You call it goodwill. Why do you need it? Because if you didn't have it, your balance sheet would have this unpleasant problem, which is it wouldn't balance. Goodwill exists for one reason and one reason alone. Without it, balance sheets will not balance. But the problem with goodwill is it sounds good. And when something sounds good, you know what you feel the urge to do? You feel the urge to pay for it. You're surprised how many emails I get from people valuing companies. I value the company using whatever approach, but there's five billion of goodwill on the balance sheet. How much should I pay for goodwill? I feel like slapping the person around the face saying, wake up, it's a plug variable. Every year I actually send these suggestions to the accounting rule writers. They seem to ignore my suggestions each year. <laughs> so about three years ago I sent a suggestion that we rename goodwill as X. In, in algebra, when something doesn't equate, you just call it x, right? 
Can you imagine opening up a balance sheet, x is equal to 5 billion? It would be a much more honest way to describe what goodwill actually is. It's x. You would never feel the urge to pay for x, right? But we call it goodwill, bad things happen. So the first thing to remember about accounting is it's backward looking. It's not their fault. Their job is to record history. And they do their job. They're going to say, this is what's happened to your company over the last, since you got formed, actually. And on the other side, the debt and the equity reflect that historical bias. So what goes into debt was what you originally borrowed, no matter what's happened to it since. And when you look at the shareholder's equity on an accounting balance sheet, what you're getting is the ultimate backward-looking number. If you don't believe me, open up Coca-Cola's balance sheet, take a look at shareholders' equity, open up any company's balance sheet. What you will see in that shareholders' equity is whatever Coca-Cola raised in their IPO, which was when, 100 years ago, and every retained earnings since. If you were writing out shareholders' equity mathematically, it's a summation of all retained earnings over time and what you originally raised on your public offering. I don't mean this is a critique, or maybe I do. Accounting is backward looking. It's historical. Accounting is also rule driven. I still remember when they were writing the rules for fair value accounting. An oxymoron, if you ask me, because you can either do accounting or fair value. You can't do both, but they want to do both. When they were writing the rules, the panel actually met in New York, and they said, can you come in and talk to us about value? No, we want to input, you know, use your input. Reluctantly, I showed up, and before I showed up, they said, can you send me what rule you're thinking about writing? So they sent me this rule over email. It says FAS 157. I didn't even read the rule. I freaked out. You know why? What does FAS 157 tell you? There are 156 other rules you haven't even heard about yet. This is the way accountants deal with uncertainty. They write more rules. Take a look at GAAP. Take a look at IFRS. Look at how many rules are written, because that's the nature of accounting. When they're uncertain, they write more rules so that they think the uncertainty will go away. So if you're an accountant, you're a very good recorder of history, and you're a very good rule follower. Let it go. Because in finance, we're not going to look at the past. We're going to look at the future. In fact, I use what's called a financial balance sheet. And I'm going to use this as a framing mechanism for almost everything we do in this class. So when I look at a company on the asset side, I see only two items. The first is assets in place, investments you've already made as a company. And pick your favorite company or your least favorite company. Think about what will go in there. So these are the investments you made last year, five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, value of assets in place. And then I'm going to have a second category that I'm going to call growth assets. You're saying, what's going to go into that? This is the value that I'm attaching to investments I expect you to make next year, two years out, five years out, 10 years out, 50 years out. I'm giving you credit for investments you haven't even thought about yet. You're saying, that's crazy. Why would I do that? Snap's going to go public in a few weeks. Now, we can talk about what the pricing for Snap will be, but rumors are it's going to be 20, 25, or 30 billion. If you pay the 20 or 25 billion for it, think about what you're paying for. You're definitely not paying for assets in place, right? Because what they have on the ground is almost nothing. They're very little revenues, very little profits. What you're paying for are growth assets, expectations that the company can do. Stuff with those assets will create value in the future or come up with new ways of making money. When you invest in a growth company, the bulk of what you're paying is for growth assets, which is built on perceptions and expectations about the future. Nothing wrong with that. You can never reflect that in an accounting balance sheet. But I can in a financial balance sheet. Snap's accounting balance sheet is going to have nothing on it. I can predict it. You know why? Because it's like writing the history of Slovenia. My wife's from Slovenia. For history, you probably run, what, seven pages. Basically, you're part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, then you're part of this. Oh, finally, about 10 years ago, 15 years ago, you became your own country. There's not much there. If you try to record in an accounting balance sheet what a company like Snap, Snap has already done, guess what? You're not, it's not the accountant's fault. So when they say the book value of equity at Snap is zero, or 10, or $100, it's not that they're lying. They're recording the past, and that's what an accounting balance sheet would show. But on a financial balance sheet, I'm not constrained by those same requirements. 
So instead of looking backwards, we're going to look forward. And I'm going to force you to do this on everything we do in this class, because you're going to be tempted to go back to the past, because that's where you have comfort. I have the numbers from last year. And I'm going to push you to say, that's fine, but I want you to think about next year, the next five years, the next 10 years. And it is going to be uncomfortable, because nobody likes to be wrong. And we know that if you're predicting the future, you're going to be wrong 100% of the time. That's OK. It's not your fault, because the world changes around you. The second thing to remember about finance is it's rather than rules, we're going to have principles. And there are going to be about three or four principles we're going to come back to over and over again. By the end of the class, hopefully, they're so ingrained that whenever you have to look at a question, you go back to those first principles. So when I define a good investment, I can use all kinds of rules. But ultimately, I'm going to also force you to think about what exactly is good about a good investment. And that's going to give you a way of saying, this rule is better than this one, or maybe I should never use this rule. So it's principle driven. So you ready? We're going to get started on the big picture. I promised you a big picture I'm going to deliver. This is the entire class on one page. One of my life's missions is to take everything I know in finance actually fit in a page. And you know what? It's getting scarily close to happening. The more you think you know, the less you actually do. So as you start compressing, oh my god, it's the same thing. I keep saying in different ways. This is the big picture page for corporate finance. And everything we do in this class is going to be on this page. So here's what we're going to start with. We're going to start with what's your mission as a business? What are you trying to do? And I'm going to specify that the objective of a business is to make itself the most valuable business it can be. Of course, I've left a lot of words undefined. What do I mean by valuable? Is it the same thing as market price? How do you increase the value of a business? But I'm going to have an objective. I'm also going to defend why, if you run an entity, you need a singular objective. You cannot have three or four or five objectives. You have a singular objective. You can have multiple constraints. So I'm going to start with the objective. There are three basic decisions and principles that are going to govern how we think about how to run a business. The first is what we're going to call the investment principle. And let me state what I would argue is the base principle that should govern how we allocate resources. When you're a business going out to take investments, here's what I want to make sure you do. Those investments need to earn a return that is greater than some minimum acceptable hurdle rate. Already I throw a buzzword in there. I'm not quite ready to define the buzzword, but I can give you the sub-principle that's going to govern that buzzword. The hurdle rate used for an investment should reflect the riskiness of that investment. Riskier investments need to make more to break even than a safe investment. So if I come to you with a safe investment, you might settle for seven. Riskier investments, you're going to demand more because if it's risky, you need to be compensated. It should also reflect where you get the money to fund the investment, how much comes from equity and debt. So the, the hurdle rate for an investment should reflect the risk of that investment and the mix of debt and equity used to fund that investment. Now, we've left, left a lot of words undefined. What do I mean by risk? How, how am I going to bring it into a hurdle rate? That's why we have 15 weeks left in the class. So we'll fill in the details, but that's the principle that's going to drive how we think about hurdle rates. When we talk about returns in finance, those returns should be based on cash flows. As opposed to what? As opposed to accounting earnings. It should be cash in, cash out. should reflect when those cash flows happen. You'd rather get the cash flows earlier rather than later. And finally, there's no garnishing allowed in investment analysis. You know what I mean by garnishing? You grind through the numbers. You come up with a decision. Let's not do this project. The guy puts up his hands. There are strategic considerations. You know where this is going next, right? This is the garnishing, synergy, strategic considerations, words you throw on the table because the numbers don't fly. And if you're doing corporate finance, your job is to push back. So what's strategic about it? Because if it matters, you should be able to show it in the cash flows and the returns. And if it doesn't, then let's stop talking about it. So when we talk about returns, it should be based on cash flows, should reflect the timing of those cash flows, should have all side effects, good and bad, already built into it. And along the way in this class, we will confront what the value of synergy is, what strategic is, and bring it into the numbers, because we leave it as buzzwords. There's no point doing investment analysis. You're going to do whatever you want to do, and justify it after the fact. So that's the investment principle. Invest in assets that earn a return greater than your minimum acceptable hurdle rate. Second, when you try to decide how to fund a business, there are only two ways you can finance a business. You can use debt, borrowed money, or your own money, debt or equity. 
That's true for small businesses or big businesses, public companies and private companies. So in the financing principle, I'm going to argue that the right mix of debt and equity for your business, notice I didn't say for all businesses, for your business, is that mix that maximizes your value as a business. So if you can find a mix that makes you a more valuable business, all the more power to you. You're saying, why would changing the mix affect the value of the business? You know why? Because across the world, the tax codes seem to be tilted towards one type of financing as opposed to the other. Maybe that'll change, but as long as that's there, that might be a way in which you can increase the value of your business. And if you ask me what kind of debt is right for me, I'm going to say, tell me something about your assets. The financing principle that governs the right kind of debt is the debt you have should be matched up to your assets. Let me explain. If you're a toll road company, you build these really long-term investments, the right kind of debt for you is really long-term debt. If you're a company that gets 70% of your cash flows in Mexican pesos, the right kind of debt for you is Mexican peso debt. You think that's so rigid. That's the principle. If you mismatch your debt to your assets, you better have a really good rationale for why you're doing it, because it's not compatible with core corporate finance. And then we get to the dividend principle. If you cannot find investments that make your hurdle rate, why? Because you're an aging company, because you're in a business which has kind of turned the corner, don't push your luck and say, the best I can do is make a 6% return on my investment. There's always a better use for your money, because if you cannot find investments that make your hurdle rate, you know what you need to do? Give the cash back to the owners. You're saying, but that'll make my company smaller. So what? There's no glory in growth for the sake of growth, survival for the sake of survival. If the reason for your existence as a business has gone away, it's time to move on. It's actually very difficult psychologically to do this because as a manager, what are you taught? taught? Grow your business, make it bigger. Right? But if you're in a business where your investments are not making your hurdle rate and they consistently fall below, get the cash back. They will find other businesses to invest in that are better investments rather than yours. Everything we do in this class is going to be structured around this page. In fact, I'm going to use this page to kind of launch into five themes that are going to run through this class. The first is nothing I've said so far should be a surprise to you, even if you've never taken a finance class. Because here's what I've said. If you can raise money at 8% rather than 9%, please raise it at 8%, right? And once you've raised money at 8%, please don't take projects that make 6, 6.5, or 7%. And a part of you is saying, well, that's pretty much common sense. I knew that already. That shouldn't be a surprise. You know how old corporate finance is as a discipline? It can be, written, it can be traced back to a paper written in 1958 by Merton Miller and Franco Modigliani, two professors of the University of Chicago. Pre-1958, if you took a corporate finance class, it was just a glorified accounting class. So corporate finance as a discipline is about 60 years old. How long have people been running businesses? It's not a trick question. I'm sure there's some very good cave business people, right? Fire for, you know, fire for sale, or new tools, new tools. Good business people through the ages have always understood these first principles. That's why you can be a great businessman and forget about not having an MBA, not have not gone to school. In fact, one of India's biggest companies, Reliance, was built up by a guy called Dhirubhai Ambani, was a fifth grade dropout. You get the first principles. Everything else is a detail. And sometimes being true to those first principles is actually a far more critical than understanding whether you can estimate a beta or a cost of capital. So that's going to be my first theme, is everything we do in this class, I want you to pass through the prism of, does that make sense to me? And if it doesn't make sense, I want you to push back saying, that doesn't make sense. Let's work it out, because if it doesn't make sense, it's my job to make it make sense or abandon it. Because if it is truly corporate finance, it should, make, it should abide by common sense. Second, corporate finance is focus. What do I mean by that? Everything we do in corporate finance, we're going to be able to pass through the test of, is this the right thing to do? And the reason we're able to do that is because we have that singular objective. That out, we want to maximize the value of the business. So if you ask me, what's the best way to pick projects? I'm going to go through four different rules. And then say, this one's the best rule. Why? Because if you do it, you're going to be able to increase your value as a business. 
So we're going to talk about net present value versus IRR versus accounting returns. And the way we're able to decide what's right for us is by using this objective of which one of these is most likely to increase my value as a business. So corporate finance's strength comes from that focus. Its weakness comes from that focus. Do you see why it's its biggest weakness? Because if you don't like this objective, if you don't think that the objective of a business should be to maximize value, nothing we say for the next 15 weeks is going to make sense to you. And I know that. In fact, if you have significant disagreements with the practice of corporate finance, it's because you have a singular disagreement with what the objective of an entity should be. So we're going to spend the next two sessions actually talking about the corporate objective. I don't think we spend enough time on this in corporate finance. We jump into the techniques and the tools, but we need to be open about both the strength and the weakness of having this singular objective. Why maximize value? Why not maximize market share? Why not maximize employment? Why not maximize social benefits? There are lots of different objectives floating around here, and you could actually argue that today's global politics, this is the big debate that's going on under the surface. What exactly should be the objective of a corporation or any profit-making enterprise? And we're going to face up to it. Now, I'm going to do something very strange. I'm going to take the objective and I'm going to rip it apart, which is strange because I'm going to build the rest of the class on it, because I want to immunize you against what you're going to hear, not just in other classes, but outside, about all the weaknesses of the objective function. And I'm going to be open about that. This is a weakness. This is a horrible weakness. And then I'm going to talk about what next and why I stay with this objective in spite of its limitations, in spite of its weaknesses. And what I want you to take out of those two sessions is not that you buy into my objective, but that if you have a different objective, that you're clear about what that objective is, rather than say, I don't like your objective and leave it at that. That's not an alternative I want you to use, because if you have nothing, if all you have to do is, I don't like that objective, and you don't have to come, with, come up with something else, that's a very low threshold to me. So we're going to talk about why we focus so much on a singular objective, and why we chose the objective we did, because it's going to be the central building block for everything else we do in this class. Another device I'm going to use all through this class is a life cycle. And as human beings, we go through our own life cycles. We're born, we're teenagers, then we kind of grow up, and some of us grow up faster than others. And, and then we spend this point of the plateau, then things start to stop working, and you're middle age, you're over middle age, and you're age. And along the way, what are you doing at every step? You're fighting aging, right? It's human nature. You fight aging how? You put on more makeup, you get facelifts. I mean, basically, it's human nature to fight aging. Businesses have their own life cycles. So you have a startup that's like a baby. The future is, you know, is endless. You can do all kinds of things. Then you come up with a product that meets an idea, and now you're facing those tests which are business tests. Can you take your idea and make it into a product? And if it works, then you have growth. Initially, the growth is in revenues and number of users and people buying your product, but you're not making any money. And then you get to a stage where people start. I, I have these things which I call transition moments. Your first transition is, can you take your idea and make it into a product? I've listened to lots of great business ideas that when people try to make it into a product, they say, you know what, this isn't working. Let's say your product idea works. You start to see it stick, people are buying it. There's, a second transition moment that I call a bar mitzvah moment. In Jewish life, bar mitzvah moments are when you're asked to grow up, right? At least in theory. No, because you know, you're 15, you're really about as grown up as you're going to be. Yeah. So there's a bar mitzvah moment for businesses. You know what that moment is? When I ask you, this is so you're a growth company, everybody's excited that you're adding users and people love your product, until somebody says, when are you going to start making money? And you say, what? I'm supposed to make money? <laughs> if that's your response, you just failed your bar mitzvah moment. Bar mitzvah moments come to every company. Some companies pass with flying colors. Some fail. We're going to talk about Facebook and Twitter along as we go through the class, because that two companies have tracked from the beginning. Facebook came to the bar mitzvah moment. It was more than ready. So when you say, when they ask, when are you going to make money? So we're already making money. Look at all the different ways we figured out how to convert Instagram and WhatsApp to making money. With Twitter, the question was, when are you going to make money? They said, well, we have lots of users. 
That's been their answer to the question for the last six years. At some point in time, it doesn't work anymore. So you make that transition, you come to a stage now where you have to convert your revenues into profits. And then you become the successful growth company. Now your job is playing defense, right? Because now if you're Google or Facebook, you want to keep the rest of the world up. But there will be a moment in, in every company's life, and it's almost unavoidable, where you start to age. And as with human beings, companies fight that aging as much as they can. By doing what? Doing the equivalent of a corporate facelift. They'll do restructuring, they'll buy new businesses. Most of the time it doesn't work. But you know what keeps them going? They say, Apple did it in 98. I think these people who write cases on companies that turn around should be put in jail, so not allowed to write cases. More damage has been done to companies because they can see what Apple did in 98 than by not knowing it at all. Because every company wants to be the next Apple. Think of Marissa Meyer coming into Yahoo in 2012. What is the mission she was given? Be the next Apple. And you can see the allure, right? If you're a CEO, you want to be the next Steve Jobs. You want books written about you and movies made about you. And you're not going to get that if you say, I'm going to reduce the size of the company. I'm going to shrink it. So what do you do? Try to be the next app. Most of the time, it doesn't work. So one of the things I'd like you to think about as, we, you know, as, we, as I force you into the process of thinking about individual companies is when you pick a company, I want you to start by, before you look at the financials, ask yourself, where in the life cycle would I put this company? Because the challenges you will face will vary depending on the where, the life, where in the life cycle you're in. Remember I said there are investment principles, financing principles, dividend principles. Which one you focus on will vary depending on the company you, you picked as your base company. If your base company is Snap, you decide to make that your company, your big decision, the big part of what you do will be the investment decision because most of your value lies in front of you. And if you're Snap, how much money can you borrow? So, in fact, let's make corporate finance really simple. If you're a young growth company, you just you know you've lots of potential. You're trying to decide how should I finance this business? What's the right mix of debt and equity for you? How much can you borrow? What's the problem with borrowing if you're a young start, a young growth company? You try to pay the banker with potential, see how that goes. So when a banker says, I have lots of potential, no money to pay interest payments, it doesn't work. So how much should SNAP borrow? Nothing. How much should they pay in dividends? Nothing. Corporate finance is quite really simple, right? So when you look at this company, it's all about the investment decision, converting potential into revenues and profits. So if you're at SNAP, if, there, if you're the CFO of SNAP, you're in that back room. Nobody's even listening to you. Because you're not the guy who drives the value of the company. They don't even know you exist. Maybe there's no CFO. Why do you need one? It's all about that investment decision. But as you age, your potential to borrow money will increase as you start making money. So CFO starts to get more important. In fact, as you get to be a mature company, your investments start to recede to the background. It's all about financing gates. So when you talk about leverage, buyouts, you're already making a confession, right? My best days are behind me, because the only way I can create value in the company is by moving things around in my balance sheet on the liability side of the balance sheet. It's shifted. This is, of course, the investment banker's sweet spot. These companies, because these are all companies, are all focused on the financing side, because the investment side is received to the background. And then there's that most depressing stage when you're in decline. You move from investing to financing, and it's all about how much cash do I return and how quickly do I return it because I want to make my company smaller over time. So what you focus on as a company will shift over the life cycle. So as you start thinking about companies and as I throw companies at you, I want you to think about where they go in the life cycle. In fact, I have a, you know, I have a session that I recently did on the right CEO for a company. When you have a startup, you want a CEO who is a visionary, right? Storyteller because it's all about the future. You want an Elon Musk. That's the kind of As you go from being a startup to building a business, you want Bob the Builder, right? Somebody who can take the idea and make it. In. Somebody cares about you know supply chains and making things work on time. And already you can see what Tesla's biggest challenge is going to be, right? 
I mean, this guy's an incredible visionary. He can get people to do what he wants, but do you think Elon Musk lies in his I wonder how the supply chain is working. He's more worried about getting you to Mars than he is about whether the cars will roll off the assembly lines. Which means that the challenge for Tesla is can they get somebody who can take care of the details to make sure the Tesla 3 actually rolls off the assembly line in 2018. Because this is a car, not a social media app. You actually need physical cars coming off physical assembly lines. And of course, people say, what about Steve Jobs? People forget Steve Jobs' first iteration at Apple, where he almost destroyed the company. It was all vision all the time, right? I, I've used a Mac since 1981. I still remember when Steve spent almost two or three years building the Lisa computer, one of the most impractical computers ever built. But he got so focused on this is what customers should want that he got focused on. Of course, they fired him, and he came back. The rest is his, his glorious history. So what was different about Steve Jobs' second round at Apple as opposed to the first round? You know, after all, the same visionary guy. What did he have in a second? The first was the experience of actually running Pixar and discovering how to run a business. The second is he had Tim Cook as his chief operating officer, a guy who was all about supply chains and making the trains run on time. In fact, if I were giving advice to Elon Musk, of course, he'd ignore the advice, because when does he ever listen to advice from anybody else? I'd say you need your own version of a Tim Cook along you, because we need visionaries, but as a company ages, the kind of CEO you need goes from Steve the visionary to Bob the builder to John the defender. And then you get to that declining phase. You need Larry the liquidator. <laughs> if you've never heard of Larry the liquidator, I'll send you the link. I think YouTube might be easy. This is from this movie called Other People's Money that I will talk about a little next, next session. Larry the liquidator is Danny DeVito in that movie. If you get a chance, go online and Type in Larry the liquidator. This guy's all about liquidation. You see, what a horrible CEO for a company in decline. That's who you need, Larry the liquidator. The fourth theme that I'm going to return to over and over in this class is that everything we do in this class applies across. This is not, in fact, I think it's unfortunate that the class is called corporate finance. Because when I say corporate finance, already you're falling the impression that this is going to be about companies making investment financing and dividend decisions. This class should really be called business finance. I mean, uh, in fact, I considered briefly using that hot dog stand guy outside the building. Th that guy's been around for 20 years. I've known him forever. As one of the businesses in this class, because I think that guy's to make investment decisions. I still remember when he went from the st a stand where he had to stand outside and make the food and dish it out to when he got this more expensive stand. Huge investment decision. When he decided to add sausage to the menu, I remember how he agonized over it. Should I do it? Should I do it? But you can see why. You make a bad investment decision as a small business. What happens to you? You don't get a bailout from the federal government. <laughs> you just go under. That guy had to make investment decisions. Did he have to make financing decisions? Absolutely, he had to decide how much to borrow. It cost him almost $30,000 to get that enclosed. He had to decide how much to borrow. Does he have to make dividend decisions? He's got two college-age kids. One of them went to Wake Forest, and the other went to State University of New York in Buffalo, I think. You know why the dividend decision matters, right? Those tuitions don't get paid on their own. He had to take cash out of the business. Investment decision financing. And I would argue that for him, the consequences of making the wrong decisions are far greater than they are for Google or Facebook or Apple or GE. Because he has no fallback. This is about any kind of business, small or large, private or public, emerging or developed markets. The principles stay the same. Which brings me to my final theme that I'm going to return to. Remember I said that corporate finance is common sense that some of the best business people in the world have no MBA, sometimes no college education, no high school education, but they manage them. Conversely, there are people with MBAs and PhDs, many of whom live in cities like this one in London and, and Tokyo, who think the rules don't apply to them. Why? Because they're special. They went to Stanford and they work at Goldman Sachs. I can do whatever I want. 
One of the things I will repeatedly come back to in this class is if you violate first principles in corporate finance, it's not a question of whether you're going to be bitten. It's, going to, it's a question of where. And I'll tell you a story to back this up. It's a company called Steady Safe. Most of you probably never heard of this company. It was a taxi cab company in, Indo in Jakarta, Indonesia, in the early 1990s. So Steady Safe was growing fast. Indonesia was growing fast. So Steady Safe wants to grow. Basically, they want to buy more taxi cabs to put on the ground so they can grow. So you're going to be my investment banker. You already know enough corporate finance to tell me what to do. So I'm going to come to you with a question. I'm going to borrow money to finance these, this acquisition of taxi cabs. So I come to you with a, my first question. is: so How long term should my debt be? You're allowed to ask me back questions. What's the question you're going to have to ask me back before you answer that? What am I buying with this debt? Taxi cabs, right? So you're going to ask, how long does a typical taxi cab last? It's about 10 years. I run them into the ground. So the answer to the first question is you want about 10-year debt, right? What currency should this debt be in? You think, what the heck is the Indonesian currency? I'll help you out. It's called the rupiah. You run a taxi cab business in Indonesia. People pay in rupiah. Your debt should be? 10-year rupiah debt, right? Let's play out what actually happened in real time. Steady Safe, early 90s, goes to an investment bank in Southeast Asia called Peregrine. At that time, I'm on a you know, pretty well-known investment bank. They say, we want to borrow money. What type of debt should we take? And Peregrine says, you should take on 10-year US dollar debt. And the rationale they gave was, the interest rate on US dollar debt is much lower than the interest rate on rupiah debt. It's 12 versus 19%. Now, to give the company credit, they said, should we be worried about the fact that we're borrowing in dollars and funding a rupiah business? The investment bank said, don't worry about it. Your exchange rate is pegged. What does that mean? The government has set the exchange rate at a fixed number. And the government has promised us that nothing bad will happen. Famous last words. Okay? But I'll listen to you. After all, you're the investment banker. I go out and borrow 50 million US dollars. And I buy these cars. I put them on the road. For a couple of years, things go swimmingly well. Until you get to 1996, and the government that had promised that nothing bad would happen did what? They devalued the currency by 70%. Let's wake up to the morning after. You're steady safe. You wake up the morning after. You look at your balance sheet. Your assets are all rupee assets, right? In dollar terms, they're now worth 30% of what they were yesterday because of the devaluation. Now, if all your debt had also been rupee debt, that would also have been marked down by 70%. You wouldn't have been happy about what happened but you wouldn't have been in trouble. But in this case, your assets get marked down 70%. You still owed what you did yesterday. Guess what happened to Steady Safe? They went bankrupt. The only good thing that came out of this is they took their investment banker down with them. <laughs> if you ask me, it doesn't happen often enough. You guys are always there at the wedding. You're never there at the divorce. Let me take that back. Your wedding planners and divorce lawyers rolled up into one. So go to the other area. They'll do the divorce for you. In fact, I'm going to say lots of mean things about investment bankers, and I will feel no. I'll just say them anyway. You know how investment bankers run these tombstone ads? You know, look how great we are. Now, big deal, bigger deal, huge deal, huge deal. And there'll be like 12 tombstones on one page to show you how great they are. I have considered actually raising money and running these ads for investment bankers with one small difference. Here's what my ad for Morgan Stanley would look like. Advisor to Quaker Oats in the acquisition of Snapple in 1992 for $3 billion. Just to be cruel, next tombstone. Advisor to Quaker Oats in the divestiture of Snapple in 1996 for $300 million. Guys, you lost a zero at the end. This is, you don't need to do any internal rate of return calculations. No, if you pay $3 billion in 92, get back $300 million in 96. This was one horrible investment. But the scary thing was, Morgan Stanley got advisory fees for doing this. I mean, I could have asked my doorman, what should I pay for the Snapple thing? He takes a swing. You know what tastes really good? Pay two, three billion, something like that. <laughs> I don't need an EV to EBITDA multiple to get to some screwed up number. So one of the things I'm going to constantly come back to in this class is when I see people doing stupid things or things that are indefensible, even if those people might be the people you end up working for, they say, you know what, 
How do you explain this? How do you explain the fact that Evercore is using a 6% growth rate forever and valuing Tesla? What universe is that going to happen in? So it's something that you're going to have, as we go through, we, you will see in the class, is taking apart actions and not assuming that just because there's a big name attached to it, not assuming that you're going to get the right answer. In terms of uh, other stuff, the, the, if you want to get a book, it's not required. The Applied Corporate Finance book, which is an obscenely overpriced paperback, I'll admit it up front, you know, I, I, I would not pay for the book. In fact, I remember the first time the book was published. You know, you're allowed as an author to buy 10 books at a 30% discount, so I order them. And you know, the, then the person says, it will cost you $700. I said, I want the books. $70 a book at the 30% discount. I don't know what it is now, but if you have a lot of money to throw around you know, and you want to buy the book, that's, that's your choice. It's, so that's a make sure you get the fourth edition. There are practice problems on the, for the book, uh, for the, on the web, web page for the book. And as we go through, when, whenever I call on data or spreadsheets, you will also find them on that same web page. In terms of the structure of the class, rather than give you a typical syllabus, here's how it's going to work. We're going to spend the next three sessions talking about the objective in corporate finance. So we're going to start with that. Then we're going to move on to spend about eight sessions on the hurdle rate, how to measure risk, how to convert that into a hurdle rate, how to bring in the mix of debt and equity. We're going to spend about three sessions on how to compute returns, why cash flows, how do you bring in the time value, how do you bring in the side effect. Then we're going to move on to the financing decisions. We'll spend about four sessions talking about the right mix of debt and equity. How do you come up with that mix for your company? And one session talking about finding the right debt for your company, matching up debt. Then the dividend principle we're going towards the end, we're going to spend three sessions. First on looking at the trade-off and dividends. And second is there are two ways you can return cash now to your investors. One is traditional dividends. But increasingly, I'm going to point to a trend in the US, but now spreading across the world of companies buying back stock. Why would you pick one over the other? What are the trade-offs? And why, as an investor, might you care about how cash gets returned? And then we'll look back and spend the last two sessions on connecting everything we've talked about in corporate finance to the value of a business. Because if the objective is value, I have to get concrete. If you do this, what will the effect be on value? We'll connect back. So essentially, that lays out the class. You'll notice session 26 is left untouched but I'll come back to that in a second. So as we go through this class, I told you it will be applied. And here's how I'm going to try to apply it. Everything we do in this class, I'm going to take six companies through as lab experiments in the class. Here's my lead lab experiment. The first company I'm going to use, and you're going to see me use this when I talk about hurdle rates, when I talk about returns, when I talk about capital structure, when I talk about dividend policy and valuation, is Disney. Why did I pick Disney? Because everybody kind of gets the company. They know what it does. You might be surprised once you start looking into the company and where the value of the company comes from, but you know, large US entertainment company. So I'm going to use that as my first lab experiment. The second company I'm going to use is Vale. It's a Brazilian mining company. You're saying, why do you go to Brazil? To get as different as I could from Disney as I can. You're an emerging market to commodity company, developed market to emerging, you know. So essentially, so you can see how corporate finance principles work for an emerging market commodity company. Along the way, you're going to have to deal with the fact that in Vale, the government has a large stake in the company, and it has a huge amount of influence in how the company gets run. You're saying, so what? We're going to look at the consequences of that for corporate finance decisions. What happens if the government has a big say in how decisions get made? The third company I'm going to use is Tata Motors. It's part of the Tata family group. The reason I want to pick that is to look at the challenges of making investment financing and dividend decisions where there's a group overlaying the company. You think, so what? You're going to see that the best interest of the group can sometimes be put ahead of the best interest of the company. That what a company does might not be in its best interest, but in the best interest of the group, how that plays out. The fourth company I'm going to use is a company called Baidu. How many of you have heard of Baidu? So you've all been to China. <laughs> it's the only way you heard about Baidu. I still remember landing in China, you know, Shanghai, I wanted to check. I had to put up a blog post before I left. I wanted to check to see whether there was a typo in it. I type in Google, and it says there's no Google. I said, $700 billion disappeared while I was on the air. Yeah. 
there's no blog, there's nothing. You know? Of course, the reason is Google is blocked and you can get around it. I know most, most Chinese have figured out their own trick. I hadn't figured out idea. I said, oh my god, what do I do now? So why don't you use Baidu? I tried and I gave up very quickly. But Baidu is actually a Chinese search engine. And why did I pick that again? To look at the challenges of an emerging market, high growth company. Many emerging market companies we deal with tend to be more mature companies. But what, what happens? When you, I've considered replacing it with Alibaba because much of what Baidu does and much of Alibaba's characteristics match up. In fact, one of the interesting things about Baidu is even though it's a Chinese company, it's traded on the NASDAQ. What's traded in the NASDAQ? Actually, not the company itself, but a shell company in the Cayman Islands that has an, it's a very, very convoluted agree, uh, arrangement. And we're going to talk about why that arrangement exists in the first place and how you, as a stock owner in Alibaba, have to think about what the consequences are of this incredibly convoluted setup that drives the company. And I'm going to talk about Deutsche Bank, a company that's on the verge of disaster, maybe stepping a little back from the ledge. But basically, I want to look at how does corporate finance work at a regulated financial service company. So you're going to find that in financial service companies, you operate with a lot of constraints. You can't make financing decisions the way you would in a regular company. So Deutsche is going to be my fifth company. And finally, to top it off, I'm going to use a company called Bookscape. It's really not a company. It's a, pub, it's a privately owned bookstore in New York City. It's a small business, it's a private business, and everything we do in this class, we're going to see how does that change if you're looking at a, an owner of a private business. So by the end of the class, you should have a sense of all of these. So let me close with a couple of very small logistical details. As we go through the class somewhere in week six or week seven, you're going to say, what the heck is he going to base the grade on? I would tell you to leave it to me, but it's never, it never works. So my job, in a sense, is to give you a grade that reflects what you get out of the class. So basically, you know, you get it. Whatever that it is in corporate finance, you, know, you deserve an A. You almost get it, then you're going to get a B or a B plus. If you're trying to get it still at the end of the 15th week, maybe a C. And if you're, you're saying, what's it? Then we're in big trouble. So basically, my job is to see whether I can make that allocation. So here's the final page for today. Here are the logistical details on how the, the raw data I'm going to base this information on. There is going to be a case. What's the case going to be on? I haven't even written it, but it's going to be something relating to something in the news that's going on. So it's going to be a case somewhere. That I'll, uh, I'll give it to you somewhere mid-semester. It's going to be due March 29th. It's worth 10%. These are the, the, so the first two are group work. The second is going to be a group project that I will describe at the start of the next class. There are going to be three quizzes, one on March 6th, one on April 5th, and one on April 26th. And they are basically going to cover the sessions leading up to the quiz. So they're not, no. no. So basically, they will cover the previous eight or nine sessions. So there'll be three quizzes, each worth 10%. And there is a final exam, which is worth 30%. So basically, that's the collection. And I told you the last page was the last page, but I was lying. Now, this is, of course, just to make sure I don't get waves of emails about what will happen if I miss a quiz. First, all the quizzes will be on the, there'll be no makeup quizzes. Simply with the logistics of this class, I can't do it. There'll be the first 30 minutes. It's open book, open notes. You can even use open iPads as long as you don't use connectivity because some of you have, you know. Okay. Here's what happens if you have to miss a quiz. Because as I said, I'm a realist. You might have to miss quizzes. If you do miss a quiz, the 10% on that quiz will get moved to whatever's left in the exams of the class. So if you miss quiz one, I'll take that 10% move to quiz two, quiz three, and the final. If you miss quiz two, I'll move to quiz three and the final. If you miss quiz three, it'll go. You know why I always have to move it forward? Because otherwise, you get strategic quiz missing. In other words, if you do really well in the first two quizzes, you can get them to wait more. But so I've played this game long enough to know all the perverse incentives in this game. Okay? So if you miss a quiz, I will move it. If you take all three quizzes, here's the bonus you get. I will take your worst quiz, and I will mark the score up on that quiz to whatever you get as average on the remaining exams. So if you get a three on the first quiz, you had a bad day, but you get an 80% of the remaining exams, I'll take the three and replace it in it, but only if you take all three quizzes. I will treat you as adults. So if you tell me you're going to miss a quiz, I will assume it's for a good reason, like what, you're sick, your spouse is sick, your child is sick. You know, you have to go to a Yankee game, you know, whatever. Those are good reasons. Okay. Stuck on a subway, though, I will check the MTA website. Okay. 
bad reasons, you don't feel ready, you're overwhelmed. I mean, I understand this is all very psychologically troubling, but uh, the, uh, so what I will trust you is you come up with a good reason, even if it's a lie. I will take you at the lie, but just wait in the cost of missing a quiz. So I will see you on Wednesday. So if you have long-term exposures, you shouldn't be using futures and options. If, you have, if you're Boeing, you might want to use futures and options simply because you have rolling your ex currency exposure changes depending on who you have contracts with. Okay. But if your exposure is long-term, then you want to start to design debt that already reflects it rather than playing the short-term game of futures and options. The more expensive. Thank you so much. Take care. Hi, how are you? Okay. What year are you in the Langon program? What year are you in the Langon? How many credits you have left? How many credits I have about half. Okay. So you're halfway through. Yeah, halfway through. So you're going to be able to get away from work to be able to come to class? Yeah, I talked to my man if it's. As I said, if there are some days where you have something you know that has to get done at work, you can always catch.